you're listening to Pixels Podcast, a show dedicated to talking about all things gaming, movies, streaming, and more. My name is Pixel Sean, and I am a live streamer looking to turn online content creation into a full-time occupation. I'm sitting down with other content creators to talk about their journey, their struggles, the lessons they've learned along the way, and just to have a good time. If you do want to support this show, you can give this show a rating, and you can also find all my socials in the description below. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, relax, and enjoy. Welcome everyone to a brand new episode of Pixels Podcast. We are joined today by longtime friends of the stream, Charlie and Harry from the UK. No, it's not Harry Potter. Just get that joke out of the way first. Um, we're going to bring them in and they can talk about their socials. So welcome guys. Welcome to the podcast. How are we? I'm good. I'm good. I was just saying how you were probably going to leave us here for about an hour. Um, <laughs> but yeah. I, I don't actually have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, good, mate. A bit tired. It's late over here. So. What time is it yeah. where you are? No. Nine o'clock, which is late for me. That's such not man. late. <laughs> Come on, that's not late at all. It's for me. <laughs> all right, now before we do get into it, I always ask um, guests to plug their social media. So if anyone is just absolutely blown away by what they hear from you two, um, <laughs> where, <laughs> where can they find you on, on the internet? Um, that would be over on Twitch, uh, twitch.tv forward slash giraffe raptor. Uh, good luck spelling that. And it's <laughs> the same over on Twitter as well. All right, sweet. And I'll put that in the um, description and show notes and all that sort of stuff. So if anyone is interested in, uh, you know, looking up these two a bit more, getting into their streams, um, yeah, it'll be in the description. What's your streaming schedule like now, guys? Uh, Tuesdays and Fridays, so we're just doing two days a week. Yeah, About sweet. Two and a half hours. Nice, nice. And you guys, um, one of the big focuses you guys do is a lot on uh, sort of retro gaming, don't you? Yeah, retro and indie. Yeah. Um, lot, lots of oddities. Yeah. The weirder, the better. <laughs> yeah. So what are you playing through right now? Uh, I wouldn't call it retro. It looks retro, um, but we're playing a bit of Cuphead. Which Charlie is making me want to kill myself, um, <laughs> as I'm quite a hardcore Souls player, and Charlie is not. So it's mm. my cup of tea. Uh, but nice uh, fun yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, Charlie leaves a little to be desired at times. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cuphead, uh, we boot up Jackbox every now and then. Yeah. Uh, just for community stuff. Um, but all our PS1 stuff's packed up at the moment because we're going to be moving house. But I, I really want to get into uh, a lot of the old PS1 stuff once we move. Yeah, yeah so. cool. So when, when are you guys moving? That's a good question. <laughs> Um, <laughs> our, our, our mortgage offer and uh, tax sort of relief in the UK runs out on the 31st of March. Uh, so okay. I hope before the 31st of March. That's, yeah. It's kind of, yeah. But, you know, solicitors and all that jazz. So yeah. we'll see. We'll see. But yeah, our house has basically just like got desks barricading the walls and doorways <laughs> and we're waiting to move. It's a nightmare. So yeah. yeah. All right, now, with one of the topics that I asked to discuss, retro games has been a, a, a big thing in, in, I guess, both of your online presence um, when streaming or making content. Why the decision to go with retro? What, what is it about that that's appealing to you guys? What, 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 what went into that decision-making? Yep. I'll let Charlie give her perspective. I was going to say, yeah. it's probably very different for both of us. Yeah. Um, for me, I didn't really have access to games when I was young. I, I had a couple of my dad's old PC games, and that was it. So for me, it was about going back and catching up on everything that I'd missed that everybody mm. else finds nostalgic and, and talks about all the time that I just went straight over my head and I didn't know <laughs> what was going on. Yeah. Um, so it's me experiencing it for the first time in most cases. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, for me, yeah, it's the opposite. I mean, I grew up with my dad playing Atari 
uh, Sega Mega Drive, you know, PlayStation 1, all that sort of stuff. I uh, used to skive off school, they go to my nan's, play Sega when I was in primary school. Um, and yeah, I've, I've still got the console I played, that same Sega Mega Drive now, and I still play on it. So Jeez. yeah, for me, it's just uh, playing games that I used to love, like, you know, you sort of Metal Gear Solid 1, uh, Silent Hill 1, and playing them on the original medium is hmm. quite satisfying and i think that's a little bit where charlie likes it as well you know she's very much into uh, more tactile mediums so like your tapes and your vinyls and i think it kind of comes back hmm. to that you know pushing the power button and opening a disc tray yeah, the and physical presence having ca- yeah and cartridges yeah. and all that uh, and it's just kind of nice and it's it can be a little bit more unique i hmm. know a lot of people use emulators but i think an idea we've toyed with is sort of having a camera pointing at the console as well as us at times just because it's kind of nice right mm. i mean we even got a is it a crt it, what would you call those tvs oh, no, the, the, the oh, fat yeah, TVs. Yeah. yeah 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 we even got one of them so we can nice. play time crisis one with the gun <laughs> nice. PS one and stuff so yeah for me it's nostalgia for charlie it's catching up yeah do you find that going back to these retro games, do you find it a little bit frustrating um, given that some might be a little bit, you know, sort of janky or, you know, mechanically not up to today's standard? Do you get a little bit frustrated with that or? I I really don't, but I think that's because we play a lot of indie games and because we both have a background making games, we're yeah. a little more forgiving. Okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'd say I'd say we are really quite forgiven with games. Um, I mean, it's not a retro game, but an example, and I'll jump back onto your, your sort of question, but an example is The Medium, which just oh. came out, mm, yeah. um, if you've seen that. Uh, it's not optimized very well. I yeah. think it's a great concept, and the game looks beautiful, uh, but we were running it, and we were streaming it, and there was a point where, honestly, it looked like Resident Evil 1 on the PlayStation 1, and we didn't bat an eyelid for ages. We just... <laughs> Like, it was as if that was normal oh. for a game that had just come out. Yeah. Uh, so I think going back and seeing the graphics, we just don't care. Um, some games kick me in the balls in the sense of, like, Army Men 3D was a game that I loved when I was a kid. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, it's going to be amazing to play this. I booted it up, and I was like, holy shit. <laughs> like, the control <laughs> were, just, were just awful, you know? Yeah. Um, so some of them kind of kick you down, and others... You know they stand the test of time a little bit more hmm. like your resident evils and your silent hills yeah the controls are a bit tanky and a bit rough around the edges but the game in a whole stands up hmm. so it's, it's nice to revisit them yeah i don't have a way to plug in my old ps1 or anything at the moment so um i have done a, um, a couple of emulators um and i recently hmm. just played through the harry potter on the ps1 oh, oh yeah that is janky <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's a nice, it's a nice game though. It's um, it's really fun, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I can imagine the controls being a little uh, bit snappy and like not snappy in a good way. No, snappy is like uh, you know, hey, you turn the camera ninety degrees, yeah. you know, sort of way. Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. Yeah, but on an emulator. And and then you get so. put on a you know on a slippery slippery surface as well. And the second one in the bank, I'm just like, oh, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They can be hard to go back to, yeah. for sure. But nostalgia helps, um, um, for sure. Yeah, but, yeah. Now, do you guys have, I guess, a favorite retro game that you always go back to? Or one that has the most fond memories for you? Well, I'm, I'm looking at Charlie. Well, I was going to say, it. mine's going to be Some City 2000 because that's the most hours of any game I've ever played in my life. Um, it was basically the only full game that I had that I wasn't demo when I was a kid. Yeah. And I used to play it on an old Windows 1995 PC in nice. my attic. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> like a little thing. <laughs> um, I mean, it's hard to say. Like, uh, from PC, I mean, Half Life One is a game I always go back to. Yes. Um, and I, I adore that game. People always slag it off these days, but I love playing the three all the way through. Mm. One Blue Shift and Opposing Force. Um, but that's kind of a typical answer. On, on a PS One, for example, it would probably be Metal Gear Solid is a full game, mm. um, but Silent Hill One as well. I didn't play it all the way through as a kid. 
but um, I don't know if you know, but obviously they were both published by Konami. Hmm. So um, Metal Gear Solid 1 came with a Silent Hill demo disc. Oh, okay. And I was about, I can't remember how old I was, but I was not very old. I was single digits. And um, my parents obviously had no idea because they don't know about, you know, gaming and stuff. Hmm. And I was like, oh, come with this other game. It turned on and, you know, you're in the school at night with the little thingies <laughs> trying to bite your ankle off and absolutely shitting yourself as a child. Yeah. But it kind of burnt a thing in where I was kind of like, i got to play that game. When I when I get older, yeah, I've, I must have played Silent Hill one about four times. And every time, I still get the bad ending. I, I'm just not very good at it. But yeah, yeah, probably Silent Hill one. <laughs> Silent Hill was a, a just a whole franchise I've just completely missed growing up as a kid. I missed out on Metal Gear, so my mate introduced me to Metal Gear. Um, on the PS One, I think it was or PS Two. I think it was PS One, wasn't it? Uh, PS1 Metal Gear 1, yeah. Yeah, so he, he introduced me to that um, and then also on the PS2 as well. Um, and it blew me away just how well that game stood up. I think I only mm. played it, you know, maybe three or four years ago for the first time. And I'm just thinking, holy shit, this game is almost like 20 years old and it still stands up to today's standard. Like, obviously yeah. not, not you know, completely, but for a game that's that old to be made that well back then, it was just it blew me away. Well, I mean, it's mechanics that are in that game, like mm. using cigarette smoke to see trip wires yeah. and going prone and the the story and the double crosses and the triple crosses and all the environments and the wackiness of the bosses and things. It, it was crazy. And you're right, story-wise and gameplay-wise, for a 20-year-old game, mm. it is impressive. Yeah. I mean, I, I skipped Metal Gear 2, when I was younger, but Metal Gear 3, I think I finished it 13 times. Oh, I love in about, 3. Yeah, yeah, 3, I, I I beat that on the hardest difficulty, which God knows how. Um, but yeah, I <laughs> fell in love with that game. I, 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 I don't know, is that retro? I guess, I guess it is. It could but, be. Uh, That's a today's a standard, later, it could though, be. It? Yeah, it is. Yeah, PS2, I suppose you got the PS5 now, yeah. so... Yeah, it's moving up there. No, yeah, no, it's nice that it's nice that you're catching up with it though. I, I'd highly recommend Silent Hill though. Mm. You'll find one a bit janky. Yeah, but like one, two, and three are, are really solid mm. still, even today. So I missed out on yeah. Silent Hill. I missed out on Resident Evil. I'm currently playing through Resident Evil Five at the moment um with with Carlic yeah. on the stream um but yeah i'm just i'm just sort of getting back into the franchises i skipped over as a kid with a because i looked at it and go nope that's too spooky for me or i just <laughs> skipped over it for whatever yeah. reason so it's it's been good just getting back to to retro games see where we've come from and it's also a little bit disappointing because you play these old games sometimes and you go well mechanically these operate and function better than some of these triple a titles that are coming out now it's kind of like oh okay i'll, I'll just i'll, <laughs> well, I'll well, stick with these old games now <laughs> yeah yeah i mean me and me and charlie we played resident evil 5 about a year ago together yeah um so. yeah i mean i played it before charlie hadn't though but you mm. quite enjoyed it i think i did yeah yeah, it's a it's a nice intro to the series that yeah. one because it's not really scary. Mm. Like, I mean, Resident Evil's not really scary anyway, mm. but that's really not scary. Yeah, um, and obviously the co-op really helps. That's oh, nice. It's, yeah, it's, it's so much fun. I'm having so much time playing through it. Who, who are you playing as? Are you, are you playing as Big Boy or are you, are you playing I, as Chris? I want to play oh, yeah. as Sheva. For, yeah. for reasons but uh, I wonder why. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the game obviously looked at me and was like look you're a big boy you're playing as chris i'm like all right yeah, game yeah, gotta, gotta be the big boy <laughs> yeah all right. the game yeah, clearly yeah. knew who i was and was like no 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 you're the big boy <laughs> who's built like a house that's you <laughs> he just gets bigger and bigger just chris he just, just gets bigger and bigger he's massive <laughs> I'm, like, he's I'm, huge. I'm like i'm not fitting through that window no way <laughs> I'm gonna leave a Not Chris. Yeah, I'm gonna leave a Chris-shaped hole in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a good one, man. You, you definitely want to revisit um, yeah. those two franchises. I mean, they're kind of classic horror from you know uh, late nineties, two mm. thousands. So def definitely good to get into. No, they're, uh, uh, yeah, they're, they're good fun games. Now. You guys say that you have a background in um, making video games yourselves. 
we'll get into that in a little bit, but is there something that, I, I guess, with, with your experience, is there something that keeps occurring in games that are releasing now or something that's just a pet peeve that you wish would just stop that you notice from your experience in game making? Overreaching. <laughs> so much. Oh, yeah. I feel like everybody's trying so hard to make this amazing game mm. and probably because of pressure they're releasing them too early and it's happening with quite a lot of indie games as well I've noticed. They're just releasing them too early when they're barely playable in some cases. Mm. Yeah, we got we got one through uh, Kime the the other the other oh, yeah. uh, month, and honestly, it looked great. Like the the material was really good. Yeah. Um, but my God, like it was like you were playing a sort of futuristic hover car, and the second you snagged a wall, that was it. It was like the wall wasn't going to let you go. And, it, and that was good because I was like, okay, so this guy's made this really nice game all by himself, retro graphics, I'm stuck to the wall, I'm just getting used to the controls, and he's giving me one minute to get around the track, otherwise it resets, and I've only just started the game. Oh, and, uh, you know, you were just dead in the water from the get-go. And yeah. I think what Charlie says as well is... Uh, I find mechanics are too complicated hmm. with a lot of games these days, um, which some people love, you know. Um, but I think it's born out of the survival esque slash, uh, not not RTS so much, but your your city builders and your hmm. your survival and sort of a, a splice between those higher genres with a lot more mechanics. Hmm. And you kind of go into games, and I mean maybe it's just me, but I can't be bothered. I can't be bothered to pick up games with loads of mechanics in anymore. Um, and I think that's why I stick to the Souls series, because it's hard series, right? But once you get into it, they're all the same. Yeah. So then I just pick them up and play them over and over and over again, because I can't be bothered. But I, I feel like developers, yeah, they want to do too much and they want to release too early. Yeah. And I get that. If you're an indie and you're working part-time job, whatever, you know, you're like, well, you know, screw this. I need to try and get it to some people maybe make a little bit of money or even just get some free feedback, you know, free testing. Hmm. Um, but my main gripe is flooding the, yeah. the market. It's not really anything to do with what they're doing with games. It's that there are just too many games. Yeah. And I, I miss, I miss the days when you went to the shop, it kind of ties into the retro thing. I miss the days of, you know, you went, you know, you'll remember this, you bought a game and it was like, Holy shit. Yeah. I have this game and it could be crap. But you would play it so much yeah. because you bought that game and that's the game that you got, right? Yeah. But now it's like I look at my Steam library, I've got a thousand games. Yeah. I've got like three hundred on my PS from like PS plus and stuff. Mm. It's like I don't even know what to play anymore. Mm. So the market is just too too flooded for me. Yeah. I I completely uh, agree. It's just like I don't know. For me, the whole experience um, has been completely watered down. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, back in the day, you know, you go down to, I don't know if you guys, I think you guys probably had it, a Blockbuster video, yeah. probably, probably yeah. not Video Easy. Do you guys have Video Easy? Uh, no, it's no. probably some weird Australian thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I think it was like a cheaper or our Aussie version of Blockbuster before blockbuster came in and steamrolled video easy out <laughs> yeah, yeah. um but yeah like there, there was a whole experience of of going down to video easy picking out a game borrowing that for a couple of weeks you know going home and playing that and lots of stuff but you know at, at the moment it's just it's so watered down and then you have the concern of you know all this pressure from investors and then even having some fans now sending death threats if if a game gets delayed too often it's just like oh this is this is a wrong turn we've we've gone somewhere wrong here <laughs> yeah. that's just the internet though in terms of you know giving people i mean so probably this is not an opinion that people will like but uh too many people who shouldn't have a voice have a voice for example uh, me being on this yeah. podcast <laughs> um you know why i mean i know but like why should i have a voice right but i'm trying to be civil whereas like you said some people who have a voice send death threats instead yeah. because they can't play a video game i mean it's it's insane um Tying on to your blockbuster thing, though. Sorry, that's just blast from the past, begging my mum. 
kind of if I could rent a game for seven more days. Yeah. You know, it's just you know, I really want to finish it though. You know, you didn't even own the game. You yeah. had a little time limit. It's like WoW before WoW. You know? Yeah. It was like a subscription. Yeah. No, it was good times, but yeah, I, I don't know. I think, yeah, like, like what you guys are saying, they're just pushing out too many things too quickly, not giving it the attention that it deserves. And, you know, you're seeing it most recently with the game like Cyberpunk. That was just, oh, that was, that was a doozy, that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, I'm a bit of a hermit with new games, but, you know, even a hermit like me can't avoid what, yeah. avoid the news. Like, I mean, even BBC has co- covered like cyberpunk, you mm. know. It was, it's like, uh, yeah, it's it's a shame, but at the end of the day, Charlie said it really overreaching. Yeah, over, overreaching. That's the I, I I don't mind if a game is complicated or it's ambitious, but just make sure it plays as it's advertised. That's it's not that big of an yeah. ask. Like if you're going to advertise it in a certain way and make that promise to your consumer. Make sure it runs that way. Yeah. That'd be nice. <laughs> oh, well, well, yeah, I mean, it's false advertising at the it end is. of the day. But um, again, though, you know, and I guess this is where me and Charlie might be leaning again. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, the tools that we would use, because, I mean, you know, I've made a little game before. I've designed a couple of games that got scrapped by my CEO. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but um, you know... You you do all that, and I, I guess it makes you more more lenient to to projects that don't get finished or polished off because mm. we the tools we use to build games are terrible. Yeah. I mean they're yeah. they're brilliant. Like what they do is incredible. And you know I'm a programmer. Uh, I don't work in games anymore, uh, but I know that when I used Unreal Engine. Um, or Charlie used 3ds Max for 3d modeling they crash all the time they break all the time and mm. these are the tools that you're using to build these games right and yeah. they and they cra- I mean I've had bugs where the bug is literally that the software has cached the problem like code from before so you try and fix something for two hours and it's actually already fixed it's just it didn't read that you fixed it Oh, so the fact God. that people are using these tools, you know, you get frustrated as a developer, you get frustrated. As an artist, you get frustrated and you're like, oh, that'll do. Hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, you're just like, that, that'll do. So Charlie's screens went black and I, I crapped myself a little bit. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, nah, it's, it's just one of those where I think it's the frustration of seeing the same thing every day. Yeah. And then you actually... From a developer perspective, I think you get a false sense of it being better than it is. Yeah. Because you get you get used to all the shitty little bugs or the fact that your camera does this weird thing or the fact yeah, that... Yeah, and you just work around it. Yeah, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, I know about that crappy thing. I'll deal with that later. And you just forget, and it becomes part of the game mm. sometimes. I mean, yeah. QA should be there to stop that, of course. Yeah. Uh, but even they might get used to silly things, so... Yeah. You know, I feel sorry for dev teams under under pressure. Really. No, yeah. I guess when you do release it out to the public, you know, you're releasing it to a whole bunch of fresh eyes and people who go out of their way to break the game and see what they can get away with. So, you know, there's there's no games that, you know, are without bugs. But I, I, I like you said, like, you know, I really do feel sorry for developers who are under such intense pressure from whether it be investors or fans or anything like that you know the more that you can support your developers the better the game will be and then the more you can enjoy yourself playing that particular game mm-hmm. so yeah, it's just sure. you know I, I i don't understand the constant pressure especially from you know investors and lots of stuff i know you want your money but you know you get more money if the game is better <laughs> it makes sense <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, you're right. I was listening to one of your podcasts um, about cyberpunk. Oh, and, yeah. And uh, I believe you were talking about the platforms and, like, not releasing it on certain platforms and things mm. like that. And uh, at the end of the day, I agree, and there probably was quite a lot of refunds and stuff. But, you know, games companies are businesses, and they're big businesses. Yeah, and realistically, they can afford. I mean, maybe not so much in the cyberpunk scene. I don't know, but 
big devs, uh, big publishers, they can afford to take the publicity hit. They can afford to take the crap and people suck it up and they forget about it. Hmm. Um, but this is a business, right? Yeah. Um, and, and you're right. They should they should advertise it completely truthfully, uh, but they don't. Um, and yeah, and and all they want to do is make money. That's it at the end of the day, right? Mm, yeah. But these poor developers, thirty grand, maybe less when you well, definitely less when you're starting. Mm. Um, you know, you don't see any of that millions or anything mm. in a cog in a machine. Yeah. But then the developers get a lot of hate compared to uh, <laughs> the people at the top who yeah. are taking home millions of pounds bonus yeah. or millions of dollars bonus or whatever. Yeah, it's a, it's a rubbish system, but I, I don't know. I don't really see it changing that much, especially now with, you know, all the microtransactions and all that sort of stuff, all these like sort of attempts to get more money out of you. I don't see this changing in, in the future. No, no, I agree. Now, with you guys doing the retro games, is it somewhere that... um? we can find your games are they are they published anywhere are they on steam or anything oh do you mean that do you mean games that we've made yeah oh our games aren't retro games but uh no no um <laughs> oh god no so no one uh, can play your games game, <laughs> my game used to play right, okay i will I, I will post screenshots into your discord all right because i the, i've made two games one i've designed one i've programmed the one i designed did okay it got me about three thousand pounds when i was in uni i think it made around 10 grand between three of us so that's not bad with that. um but then uh, yeah then i wanted to learn how to program so i made a game called runner runner which was about a pink robot in a colorless land and you have to collect flowers which, <laughs> which bring color back to the land which is a mechanic that's now being used to death uh, yeah, I everywhere. Think I made that five years ago or yeah. something, five six years ago, it'd already been around, but now it's been used in a lot. Hmm. I mean, it was shit, but it was all made by me. I programmed it, did the art, did the sound. It was shite. It didn't really do anything. And then <laughs> uh, the the last game I made again was an indie thing with me and a friend. It was called I don't know if it's still in the App Store, but it was like cake something do, do you remember this yeah actually i did find it on the app store last year so it might still be there but essentially it was like uh, uh i guess i guess a little like overcooked but yeah. not like just cakes going across on the conveyor belt like red velvet or chocolate or victoria sponge and, and you got orders coming in yeah and you had to put like cherries candles icing or whatever order it had to go on and it got faster and faster and faster or yeah. something um, but me and my friend, we made that in a week um, and published it. So that was quite cool. Made no money. It was just a free daft game. Yeah. But, but neither, I, I've not worked sort of in the industry as a developer. I've just worked as an independent developer. Okay. What was the, um, what was the first game about that you made with, um, with a couple oh, of sorry, people? Oh, sorry. No, I completely skipped over that. I was yeah. like, hey, this one made money. And then I didn't talk <laughs> about it. Uh, it was, it was called, <laughs> it was called, um, Solace the Escape. And I would be very surprised if that's still not on the App Store, but I'll check. Uh, well, it was only on Android, I think, because we hated Apple. Yeah, good. Um, at the time, we were like, you know, those those rebellious boys. Screw these guys, <laughs> Android. Uh, oh, and also, we couldn't afford a Mac. Um, but yeah, so that that was about. It was a Escape the Room game, essentially. But it was a weird time. You know, the room. Hmm. Yeah. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah, the game. Yeah, it was a like... hell of a, yeah. You were like, hmm, the, yeah. the movie or the game? Uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> so the room, the room, was being developed at the same time when we were creating this game, uh, okay. but it was kind of like the opposite. So we did, we did pre-rendered panoramas of rooms, and you were in the center of the room. So instead of the traditional, you click and it shows you like a different wall. It was like you dragged and it kind of went around a sphere. Um, whereas the room, obviously, the center of attention is in the middle of the room and you spin around it. You've probably never played it. It's a mobile game. But that came out at the same time as us, and it was, but theirs was done better. And right, it was okay. Done with, but, and it was done with real-time models rather than renders. Ah, uh, okay. So we got fucked. Uh, and also, <laughs> and, 
and all. I mean, I had no idea it was coming. Honestly, they got released like right next to each other, uh, and we got loads of our reviews were good, but we got loads of reviews going. This is just a shit version of the room. Uh, <laughs> so, so, uh, the, the timing was unfortunate. But it was based off my parents' house. Uh, you're a guy. You get kidnapped. I got some free voice actor actress to play the villain and play the the sort of sub villain. Yeah. And they leave you like taunty, creepy notes and stuff like that. It was pretty good. It was quite ominous. Um, but I'm really proud of it still today that yeah. I made that much money and we just made it in the summer. Me and my friend and his brother. And that was it. No, that's really so. good. Are you guys interested in going back into the game development space or are you guys just sort of put it on hold for now or? Yeah, we're. Um... I don't want to say too much about it, but we we have oh, started designing exclusive. something. Oh, uh, this is a Pixels podcast exclusive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just because yeah. I, I don't want to commit to anything that I'm then going to yeah. not do. Not <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah. So, we're going to make a game. You heard Maybe. it here first, guys. Someday. They're making yeah. a game. Yeah. It's going to be released <laughs> March 2021. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. Yeah, I mean, we might do some stuff on, like, sort of personal indie level, like Charlie said, yeah. if we find the time, um, but I have no intention um, of ever going back towards the game industry, yeah. or even being a programmer in the game industry. I get paid better in my sector, mm. and the the work is more sprawling, so yeah. you can move easier, stuff like that. Um, however, I do miss the perks of working at technology, like uh, sort of 3D rendering slash game companies. Mm. Um, I couldn't believe it when I started my current job about two years ago and I had to bring my own coffee. I actually couldn't believe it. Um, you had to bring your own it, coffee? It was, yeah. Oh, yeah. Most companies are like that here. What? I know it sounds silly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, mate. Yeah. I turned up. I, you know, I was used to getting you know, graze boxes and flapjacks and coffee and fruit and Coke and beer on a Friday and all of this. I turn up and my boss goes, do you want a coffee? And I went, yeah. And he walked me over and he went, oh, you can use some of mine today. Get it. Tomorrow you'll want to bring your own. <laughs> Get it yourself. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. You, you want coffee? And I was yes. Like, Get it yourself. And I was like, yeah. I was like holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's shocking. Yeah, but, but that. But, you know, so I miss that. I miss the perks of being treated like a little princess. Yeah. Because because you're a valuable resource to yeah. the technology. Um, but the money is just, I, I, I get paid better. I can buy my own coffee. Yeah. You know. There's um, the trade-off, yeah. Yeah. No coffee, but, more money. Mm. <laughs> you know, I don't make games. I now make car insurance crap. Yeah. But it's all software. Yeah. So, but games are fun it's just people often think it's the same level of fun as playing games and it isn't yeah uh it's one of those misnomers unfortunately so with that debbie downer on game development um <laughs> if anyone was still interested in getting into game development is there anything that you would recommend that they do or get into if they actually are seriously considering getting into game development should we should, should Charlie and I answer it from an artist and programmer perspective? That yeah. might be quite nice. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do a master's. <laughs> that's that's my first recommendation. Uh, at least in the UK. I don't know what it's like outside of the UK, but I think it's better to take that year out and not spend like all of the, the student funds and, and have the, the debt mm. and just make that year, like take it to make a portfolio. Yeah. Because I basically came out with my master's with nothing. <laughs> you did come out with a master's. Well, I came out with yeah. a master's, yeah. but that's not helpful <laughs> yeah, no, no. without a portfolio. It's, in it's that similar industry. down here where it's like, you know, you can go to uni and all that, university and all that sort of stuff and you get the nice piece of paper at the end, your qualification, but a lot of jobs will say, okay, but let's see what you've actually done. And if you don't have any yeah. portfolio or anything to, to back up what you're saying you're capable of, then there's no chance you'll, you'll get in. Like a lot, a lot of my jobs that I've got into have been purely based on my experience rather than 
formal qualifications and just keep putting my hands up for things in the job place and um, get that experience. Like they don't really care about the nice piece of paper you get at the end of a qualification. They want to see that you can actually can do it. Um, and yeah, have that evidence yeah. to back it up. No, I think that's true. Uh, you know, I've always called degrees the first key because yeah. Uh, oh, how, how lame but uh, <laughs> as in I always imagine jobs when you're first starting for sure mm. is that there's two doors and if you want something specialist you need at least an undergraduate degree yep. yeah. you will not you will not get in the games industry without a degree mm. it just will not happen um, not anymore but once you've had a job then it's okay which is what Charlie is saying don't mm. bother doing a masters get your degree because then you've proven that you can study it but you don't need to specialize further with another year of study. Yeah. Uh, on the programming perspective, though, I would recommend a master's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> only if your undergrad isn't game focused, though. Mm. Because some people will do computer science, which is great, but that's good for like jobs that I'm doing now. Whereas it's a bit generic for games, yeah. so it's kind of nice to do a, a gaming masters afterwards if you're going to do games programming. Okay. Um, but honestly, it is for me. It's just practicing and maybe trying to find a specialization. It depends if money is a big factor for you. Like it is for me, right? Hmm. I, I I definitely work for money. I don't, you know. And at the end of the day, specialize. Do something like um, being a technical artist, or be a graphics programmer, or mm. an engine programmer. Be be something a bit more complicated if yeah. you can. It's bloody difficult to do all the physics calculations and all that stuff. It's more heavy duty. Mm. Uh, but if you just kind of go in and you go, "Oh, I want to be a gameplay programmer," you're never going to earn as much yeah. or have as much respect as someone who makes the actual games engine. Like yeah. the graphics and the physics engine and all that. So, if you can try and specialize, then that's that's better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I definitely I recommend with, with any job getting into something. I, I guess a bit of a niche, but having those skills still be transferable to other companies and and other roles as well. If if you yeah. can do one thing that no one else in your office can, you're you're immediately more valuable than everyone else. So, I, I definitely mm -hmm. recommend. Yeah, just. I have no idea about into game design, the qualifications around it, but if anyone is interested in it, make sure you hone in on some skills that not many other people have just to sort of set yourself apart a bit. Yeah, most people will jump into Unity or Unreal Engine tutorials yeah. and they'll just mm. do the gameplay side, which is great. You, you want to know that. You need to know that. Mm. But then go, oh, I'll, I'll learn a bit of DirectX or I'll learn a bit of OpenGL, yeah. see what I can do. Like In my job, it's different, but... You know, I turned up to my job, I, I barely knew anything yep. because I was coming from games into general software. It wasn't really too transferable, but they were like, oh, yeah, one of the reasons we hired you is because you've made some uh, apps before yep. for iPhone and Android. Nobody else here has that. Yep. And like you just said, if you have those little, little things that other people don't have, it in instantly makes you more hireable. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, now... When I get people onto this podcast, I'm talking like it's a big thing. It's not. <laughs> I <laughs> I like to ask certain subjects um, to discuss. One thing that was raised was archery. Who does mm. that? Tell me more about that. Um, well, we've both been doing it recently. Okay. Uh, obviously, the lockdowns have put a bit of a dampener on that. Um, you can still do it from your we backyard, were... right? Just shoot an arrow into the uh... sky? <laughs> Why not? Our backyard um, backs right onto a hill. Um, it would basically be like sieging the village at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but yeah, so I did quite a lot of that as a kid. Yeah. And I... it's always really annoyed me that games don't reflect it like properly <laughs> there's um you're gonna have to explain this for yeah. sean, sean have you done archery um i've done it a couple of times not not too often 
so you might know a bit there. Yeah. So do you mean that the, the feedback and the motion of it, or...? I mean, like, when you see an animation of a character holding a bow uh... about a foot away from their face and aiming from their chest like they're going to be able to hit anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it does bug you. Oh, it's a it bit of your pet peeve. It me yeah. so much. So as soon as you get... said, that's what I know. <laughs> yeah, true. So as soon as you get into the sport, you're like, nope, this is all wrong. <laughs> it's one of those things, right? You can't yeah. see it, can you? So. Yeah. Uh, so, so you're both into archery, are you? Are you both sort of getting into it? Yeah, yeah. We did, um, we did a, a little, like training course yeah uh, just before we went into the new lockdown so we got certified to shoot on rangers nice uh, so as soon as lockdown's over we're gonna go do that sign up yeah it's what it's one of those nine things uh where to shoot at a club you have to get the beginner certificate right okay. so i mean i definitely was a beginner uh, i'd done a little bit of archery but i'm a left-handed archer so it's charlie but she didn't uh... know at the time um <laughs> so i couldn't shoot for shit with her bow uh, but I've done a little bit, and then so yeah, I've just done the beginner course really. Mm. But we both we both got new bows, taking that up. We're thinking about getting a crossbow as well. Oh, um, nice. So yeah, and I, I'm I'm getting into shooting as well once lockdown comes out. So yeah, we're all about the projectile weaponry mm. spots. Nice. Up in here, so. Yeah, come yeah. out of lockdown, bloody warriors. <laughs> <laughs> militant, militant vegans, mate. <laughs> So you're, you're both left-handed, are you? Um, I'm not left-handed. But you should uh, be a bow. I'm left-handed dominant, so I'm supposed to shoot a left-handed uh, bow. Okay. But I never knew that until this class. So right. I've always been shooting right-handed, wondering why I'm like a foot away from where I'm supposed to be. Yeah. And so when you say left-handed, <laughs> that means you're pulling the, the the string back with your left hand, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I, I just saw the panic on Charlie's face. I was just trying to think about it <laughs> like, in my head. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> no further questions. Yeah. Move on. <laughs> I um I, I tried doing a left hand pull. This is ages ago, back when we were kids. It was so dumb because we had arrows flying everywhere. We're, we're at school camp, and they're like, yeah. "Yeah, yeah, line up and you know see which way feels more comfortable for you." And we're having these, you know, the arrows are disconnecting and they're flinging up in the air. I'm, I'm surprised no one got hit, but yeah, they made us try, um, you know, changing our stance and our hands, you know, whether it's left or right hand. And I couldn't for the life of me get this bow out on doing a left hand pull. Um, but getting, getting, you know, do, doing it the right hand, I could actually at least get it to hit the board. Um, yeah, yeah. It was absolutely hopeless doing a left hand. <laughs> Where's one of those things? Some people are interchangeable. Um, like I, uh, like I dominance wise, it tends to be more about like what mm. Charlie said. So Charlie, you know, would write. She writes right-handed. You're mainly a right-handed person. Yeah. But because her left eye is more dominant, she shoots left-handed instead. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. It's like I'm kind of blessed with shooting that I can shoot left eye dominant or with both my eyes open. Oh, okay. Some people have to shoot right eye open. So yeah, it just just depends on the person, really. Yeah. It's quite easy to tell. Um, yeah. So are you guys, I'm looking... not going to go. In... <laughs> <laughs> are you guys looking to compete eventually, or is just to keep it as a hobby? Or um, I probably do like some amateur like competition y stuff. That might yeah. be quite fun. Yeah, I might, I might do. I mean, I'm more into my bare bow, um, long bow, you know, re, uh, what were they called? The the horse bow. You know, I'm more into all the funky, weird bows, whereas yeah, okay. Charlie's more into the more technical recurve yep. shooting. So, yeah. Oh, so nice. I probably can, but there's probably less competitions around what I want to do yeah. compared. Yeah. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah, send some, send some photos of your bows. I want to see what they look like. Yeah, sure, we'll sure. set them up. Yeah. Now, another thing that was raised as well <laughs> is gardening. Oh, my God. You're, you're, actually, you're actually bringing up the fact that... We've... Okay, cool. Uh, who, who's got the green thumb? What's going on? 
apparently because you're secretly <laughs> boomers so oh, wait, everything's coming out on this season. podcast <laughs> oh, no. we were laughing in the car on the way back from the shop before this <laughs> that you were never going to use that i'm, I'm yeah. using all of it <laughs> okay um <laughs> we're, both, we're both we're both into uh gardening really yeah oh, yeah um, definitely therapeutic i guess it's helped you through lockdown quite a lot isn't it mm. yeah it's it's an excuse to go outside which yep. is is great for my mental health and it stops me from murdering our neighbors <laughs> nice positive. yeah i mean obviously it's winter at the moment so we haven't done much but yeah. uh you know we propagate quite a lot of plants we we try and grow our own veg and fruit yep. as best we can in the uk um because it's crap I'm very jealous of other countries and what they can grow. Mm. Um, but like, for example, you know, we grow, we have a lime tree at the moment with about six, seven small limes on it. You nice. Know? And the fact that, yeah, and the fact that last year, you know, we pull a lime or a lemon off a tree in the UK and then have that in food or drink or it, it, there's something very satisfying and mm. grounding about growing growing your own produce that you use at least that, that's what it is for me i'm more about the produce side of it yeah oh, yeah um i think i don't know it's something nice like i'm not an exercise person which is <laughs> a nice way of putting it um, but, <laughs> but i don't know i like doing something that has a productive end of the day so like if i can go outside and dig a hole and plant a tree that's good for me yeah. because I get the exercise in, but I feel like there's a point to it. <laughs> yeah, there's an end result to to the work you're putting yeah. in. Yeah. No, I get that. I went um, in my garden yesterday, actually, and I just pulled out all the weeds. I'm just like, oh, mm. I'm so sore today. <laughs> yeah. I can't stand weeds. Like, you know, I, I look at them growing. I'm like, oh, you're going to be a bitch to pull out. <laughs> Mate, I mean, I'm looking forward to moving because when, when we moved, we didn't. And this is kind of what got us into gardening. It's kind of weird what, how you adapt quickly. Yeah. When we moved, it was the main reason we stopped streaming was we where we moved, there was no internet line. So we didn't have the internet uh, for three okay. months. Yeah. So we just garden, but we turned up and we only have like a bit of border at the back, a bit of soil. Um, and it was just overgrown to shit. Yep. But like we pulled it out and there were three strawberry plants. Just underneath the mess. Oh, and we're like, oh, this is great. Yeah, so, we, so, we actually, yeah, so we, we actually have a whole huge strawberry bed now. Oh, from awesome. those plants, which is nice. Um, but you're talking about weeds. Mm. We have like a sort of freaking... Um, what you call it, two towers, Lord of the Rings shit going on at the back of our garden <laughs> where, where we we have this tiny fence and like Charlie said, it's on the top of a hill. No one gives a crap about this bit of land and the amount of brambles and nettles and yeah. sticky weed, and it all climbs over the bastards. It's uh. like, get back! Get back over <laughs> the fence! And, and we can't get over. So it's just a constant war uh. between uh, these things. So Yes, yeah, so I'm looking forward to moving because it's a it's a right pain in the ass. They, and they grow back so quickly. I remember I pulled these weeds out only a few weeks ago, and then oh, probably about three weeks ago, and then they're just back stronger than ever before. And I'm just like, mate, give it a rest. Like I douse this thing in weed killer, and there's nothing Little stops shit. it. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, um, they are resilient. I, I feel like with um yeah with ISO, a lot of people got into into gardening. I, my um my girlfriend and i got into growing our own sprouts um mm -hmm. that was right. fun just having them in a jar <laughs> that in was fun jar. yeah right. okay. and then um no. we also yeah it kind of similar you know we wanted to grow sort of our own produce and, and stop buying from the store because especially my girlfriend she's very very um health conscious she's uh, vegan as well um yeah. and she's very very health conscious you know she really only wants to buy organic so we're like okay cool we'll set up the garden bed pull all the weeds out and, and see if we can grow anything we put some carrot seeds in there they didn't grow at all only weeds grew i was like okay cool so we pull, <laughs> <laughs> so we, we pulled them out we tried to grow our own beetroot um and we actually got a couple of um 
the beetroots out of it and they were really really nice i was like wow it, it makes such a big difference when first of all you know it's more rewarding that you grow your own food but mm-hmm. secondly yeah. it's not doused in pesticides or other chemicals so you're actually getting a very real taste of what whatever you're growing is meant to taste like and i was just like whoa this is a massive massive difference um from just store-bought they're obviously a lot smaller and didn't look as nice but the the flavor difference was just insane oh it's it's huge the the thing that we've noticed it most with is um tomatoes which yes. I, I guess is probably because they're shipped from so yeah. far away to mm. us. Yeah, we don't exactly grow tomatoes here. <laughs> yeah. So they just get packed with nitrogen and are picked got... off green and then coloured red and all yeah. sorts of crap. So, yeah. It, it tastes so much better. I was going to say, you guys can actually grow them out there or? Uh, only in the summer. So yeah. So for like seven months of the year we grow them okay. in massive quantities yeah. and then we have no tomatoes for the rest of the year <laughs> yeah but, but i mean, but I mean we, we do some stuff inside like we we grew peppers we grew chilies yeah mm. you know uh strange varieties of stuff yeah but, yeah it is super rewarding so sometimes i do wonder if it's a sort of weird effect that your brain has that you think it tastes better because in your garden <laughs> you know like like you're like oh this is better and it's like is it better is it? Though? It probably is. It is because it's I mine. Know, I, don't, I don't trust myself. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I do, I do want to get more into gardening and lots of stuff, but I pulled these massive plants out of my garden bed just to sort of get it ready. But then um, we've been having really, really hot days here in Australia. So we had a couple of mint leaves um, or mint plants and, and basil and all that sort of stuff. I accidentally left it outside in a 40 degree day. <laughs> And then I Shit. come back home and the leaves have already wilted and turned brown in a day. I'm like, well, <laughs> they're dead. Uh, I like mint. Yeah, mint's pretty prolific as well. It so, is, yeah. Man, it, about that sun, though. it was yeah. about eight hours of just direct sun, about 40 to 45 <laughs> degree heat. I'm just like, mate, you had no chance, little buddy. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, man. Jeez. I miss I miss things being warm. Yeah, you know, yeah. warm for us is like twelve degrees. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I see on the news. <laughs> this is way off topic, but um, you guys have like a a twenty five degree day, and you're talking about a mental. heat wave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, we got <laughs> mental. Yeah, yeah. Everybody starts dying. <laughs> like the, all the aircon sold out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? But the thing is, we. We go through winters like this, and they're so shit. I was talking to Charlie. I was like, "Oh, does you know does Sean not mind getting up at you know eight o'clock to do this?" And I was like, "Actually, the bastard's got heat and sunlight, <laughs> so I was like, yeah, he probably doesn't mind." You know, our morning looks like our like we wake up and it's like it's night time here. Yeah, yeah, it goes sucks. dark at like half three. Uh, so. Yeah, so when we get 25 degrees, woohoo! Jeez. Get the barbecues out is what we say. But yeah. Have you guys ever always... been in like a 40, 45 degree day? Not in the UK. Have you ever felt that? <laughs> India for you? Maybe. No, Turkey. It used to get ridiculously hot there. Okay. Mm. See, at least yeah, you know what me... it feels like. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if I got that high, but Vietnam, I had some pretty hot. Hot days in Vietnam and the yeah. Philippines, but yeah, um, definitely up in the high thirties probably. Mm. But I mean, it, it's mental, really, the heat. But I, I would take it over the cold uh, any day. Yeah, uh, personally, so I, I, I'm the opposite. I, I, I'll, I'll take the heat in Southeast Asia. Um, I'm mm. fine with that. But I, I don't know what it is. The, the sun here in Australia is just it's so brutal it's so hot it's so dry i'll get sunburnt on a 20 degree day that's how just insane the sun is but when i went to to europe or southeast asia i'm walking around i didn't get sunburnt once and it's just 30 35 degrees you know the humidity is very high and i didn't put any sunscreen on or anything and i just you know didn't get burnt at all come down here on a just go for a little walk around the block and i'm just coming inside like a bloody lobster i'm like what the hell happened <laughs> yeah i mean I've, I've never been down there so i oh, don't know it's... but yeah asia was always okay i guess turkey was okay mm. no i used to get down there as well but when i went to mozambique that was like 45 degree 
sort of days mm. and I used to because we were working on a construction site building foundations for a classroom um so I was in the sun all day with no shade I never yeah. once put sun cream on or got burnt nothing and then in the UK when it's like 12 degrees I get burnt yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is it's a weird thing for me because Charlie traveled a lot when she was younger mm. I mainly traveled around Europe uh, like most British people do um and then I went to where the hell did I go oh, I went to the Philippines yeah. by myself I was like yo no so I went to the Philippines <laughs> and my layover was in Oman it was a quick change um but the door, I remember flying over and I was like, holy shit. I was not expecting countries here to, to be so rocky, which was very daft of me because mm. there's loads of rocky landscapes. <laughs> um, but anyway, the plane, it was so bright. It was seven o'clock in the morning and the plane door opened and I felt the heat. And uh, it yeah. was crazy as like yeah. 23, 24 year old who had not left Europe and I got hit by that heat at 7 a.m. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, what the f- yeah. flippity jibber, right? <laughs> like, it was just like, what? what is this? Is this even, like, possible? And then <laughs> when I was in the Philippines, I just kind of got addicted to the heat. Yeah. And I think, honestly, ever since I have came back from Vietnam a few years later, I've always missed the sun and I've mm. always missed the heat. Um because, yeah, we just get so depressed over here, especially in winter. Yeah, you um, definitely feel a lot better when you actually get some proper vitamin yeah. D from an actual sun. I mean, yeah. I'm a British, so we're by default depressive and miserable. <laughs> and, so, yeah, it doesn't help. <laughs> All right. Um, I think we'll wrap up in a bit, um, but I did want to mm. ask, I guess going back to what we were talking before about future plans of content um you know whether it's streaming making videos making games anything like that um what's in the works what could people look forward to um coming from from you two Oof, that's a broad spectrum um i don't know i guess we're definitely going to keep live streaming yeah uh, so definitely more more indie games in the works we we kind of get sent quite a lot of those through through keymailer um so we're basically always going to be sort of checking those off reviewing them and so it's something a bit different at least once a week and um then i guess we're mostly just gonna hang out with people because getting yep. to know people all over the world that's that's kind of the point for me anyway hmm. of, of live streaming it's one of the beauties of it um but yeah, I think maybe I want to do a bit of YouTube again. Yeah, that'd be nice. Getting back into that. Well, you got a- anything in mind, or just generally want to get back into it? Um, I think I might do some game reviews. Nice. Over on there, that'd be that'd be nice. Doing some some condensed kind of really short edits. I think. Yep. <laughs> I'm just I'm imagining like a, a zero punctuation vibe. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah uh yeah yeah just continuing as we are i mean I, i'll always pick up you know games that charlie's probably not as interested in um yeah. so you know sometimes i might just steal the stream spot because i want to <laughs> uh, so like maybe if resident evil the village is actually good um of course know, it's gonna be, be good like, it's gonna be I mean, vampire like, lady has it got, uh, you know, I, I tell you what I'm brilliant at, right? I'm brilliant at not looking at stuff. Like, I, I, I call that skill. In, in, in the day of the internet, I call that skill. I know nothing about Resident Evil 8, apart from it's called Village. Oh, mate. So, I, that's how I go into games, though. I, I don't look at anything. I just go, it's Resident Evil, cool, let's go. And then it's just a shock. Uh, you know, 7, I had no idea either. So, uh, yeah, right. I know there's a lot of weird shit. And I did hear you and Carlick talking about some big boobed woman. But, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but minus that, I mean, that sounds fine to me and, and kind of a staple for Resident Evil anyway. Um, but, yeah, sometimes I might steal the spot. But otherwise, 
you know, we, we lost contact with quite a lot of people, you mm. know, people were doing their own thing. We didn't have internet for a while. Some other people didn't have internet for a while, but, but Charlie's right. You know, we're sat here talking to you, Charlie, yeah. met you, uh, introduced me to you. I like, uh, Karlik a lot. Yeah. And then we've got quite a few friends in Scandinavia, Israel, you know, like all over the world and, uh, just having them to turn up every now and then, you know, it ain't about views. It ain't about that. Um, and for us, what, what I really like, especially from a developer perspective, is getting these indie games and booting them up. They can be as shit as anything. Hmm. But to boot it up and go, right, okay, someone's actually tried to make a game here. Let's give it a try. Let's see what they've done. Have they done anything differently? That's interesting. And we don't really review on streams, hmm. but we kind of talk about it and say, like, that's a really cool idea. That's a really cool mechanic. Yeah. Um, this thing didn't work that well. And... It's just nice to see what people are doing without, again, I don't look at them, so we just play them. And, mm. Yeah. Uh, we go in blind on all of these games. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's kind of what our thing is, really. Uh, but, yeah. yeah, live streaming will keep going. I, yeah. I probably won't do anything else uh, personally, but Charlie might do YouTube. Yeah. I think, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. If you guys do get into, or Charlie does get into um, reviews and lots of stuff, I love listening to other people's opinions on games. And especially if you guys have a different perspective coming from your backgrounds, to me, that's really, really valuable because you guys are looking at a game in a completely different lens. And, you know, what I, I'm just that scrub who bought it off the, um, <laughs> off the shelf and I'm either I like it or I don't like it. And that's basically it. You guys can break down the mechanics of it. Um, and that to me is really, really interesting because you get a whole new different perspective on on you know how difficult a game is to actually make all the you know the the behind pressures of getting a game out and all that sort of stuff and just mechanically how difficult just trying to do something you know even physics based could be in a game so i'm yeah super looking forward to any reviews that you guys are going to be putting out um i think that's going to be great yeah it's cool i mean yeah it's just things like even i'll play a game and i'll see a shader that I think is cool. And I'll be like, holy shit, how did they code that? You know, like I'm thinking about that sort of stuff um, all the time. Or, But it kind of ruins games, you know? It's like if you work in film, mm. yeah. I'm like, oh, we're walking here and there's a trigger on the other side of the room. That's going to spawn enemies. And you walk in and it's like, Jiro's like, get him. You're like, oh, for fuck's sake. Yeah. It's like, well, I knew that was coming. Yeah. Right. I mean, people like yourself, though, who just play games, you kind of start to pick up those tells anyway. Yeah. You know, you play a game and you're like, well, this is a boss arena. This yeah. is the friend play. So, hmm. yeah. So, but it's kind of like that, but slightly enhanced, I suppose. Uh, a, a, game, a game that can really impress me now if it just sort of keeps me on my toes and just keeps surprising me with what it can bring. Um, <clears throat> one example is the new Miles Morales game, I hated that because it was so predictable. Um, and I had a 20 minute review of basically just saying it was DLC for 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm glad no one saw oh, it, but really okay. it was just, yeah, I, I just, I couldn't stand it. It was so predictable. It was just paint by the numbers sort of game. It just felt super uninspired. And you know, you could walk into a room and you go, cool, this is going to happen. Oh, there's a generator. You need to power up or power down. And we go into the next room, a bunch of goons come out. It was so predictable. But then you have games. One of my favorite is Owl Boy. Have you guys played that? I own it actually, but I've not played it. <sighs> you definitely should. So it, it, it was, it's, I think it is an indie developed game. But it, mm -hmm. to me, it's one of the best games I've ever played. You can go into a room or you can go into a new scene and you have no idea what's going to be there. There's all these different and, and brand new enemy types and they pair them all together. The controls are so tight. It's just every single time I play it, I'm always finding new things to do in there. And it's one of the best games. But yeah, I, I, again, for me, like... As you said, I am picking up on certain, you know, tells now of uh, walking to a room, music starts, obviously going to have a boss on, you know, there's a couple of chests going to be there. Okay, there's obviously something on the way. <laughs> yeah, in in yeah, this yeah. game, it's just, you know, you're just going through and you just have to deal with whatever's coming and then and there's no predictability at all. So I definitely recommend, you know, getting into Owlboy, but this is the problem I'm having with a lot of these newer games now is like they're all are so predictable and yeah. they're just, I don't know, they feel kind of uninspired. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember what game it was. You might remember. 
But we were on about what Sean just said, which is um, you pick up stuff. Like, you know, you, you're running through, you're in a survival game, and it's like, here's 30 handgun bullets, here's a health kit, here's a... I can't remember what it was, but I was playing a third-person game, and it gave me loads of shit. And I was like, oh, it was The Last of Us 2. Oh, that was yeah. it. Ah. And, I, and I said to Charlie, it's so simple. Don't give them anything, right? Hmm. And if they die, or if they don't have enough stuff then spawn some stuff there. Yeah. And even that tiny change would not give you that foresight that a big fight is coming. Mm, yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you can balance the game because you can go, fuck me, I've got one bullet and a knife. And yeah. then you just die, right? So you shit at survival games, number one, mm. right? Because you, you can't resource manage. Fairly. Exactly. Um, but then, okay, you shit the game, but we're not going to punish you too hard because now when you spawn... Here's some shit yeah. because you know that fight's coming. Yeah, that one change mechanically will change how a player views the game. You'd play that game, you'd go, "Well, I have no idea what's going to be out here," mm. and a big fight would break out. Right? It's little things like that that I look at in games, and I go, "Why? Why can't people pick up on this?" Yeah, it's like when you're playing a game and there's a checkpoint just before an unskippable cutscene for a boss yeah. that lasts three minutes. Yeah. And you die and you have to watch it again. Who the fuck hasn't thought to put a skip button yeah. or put the checkpoint after the cutscene? It's these little things where I'm like, how the hell are people missing this? Yeah, you know? exactly. Um, but yeah. yeah. I think it really just, just comes down to um, just respecting the intelligence of your player. Like, yeah. If, if oh, you're, yeah, yeah like, like you said, if you're just loading up on you know resources in a survival game right before a boss is like it, it for me at least it just takes me right out of the game i'm like okay now i can sort of like you know predict what's going to happen and then i'm not not no longer invested in the story i'm now thinking okay there's going to be some big boy around the corner here that's going to clap my cheeks and you know <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. That, that'd be yeah, it exactly. but if you yeah. just you know respect the intelligence of your player and just have the notice be like okay you're playing a survival game resources are probably one of the most important things you can do and if if you haven't you know been loading up or you know conserving your resources that's on you and you get punished for that and you know once you die that's it you come back and as you say you know put in a few more resources and then the player learns very very quickly to say hey this game isn't gonna you know hold my hand throughout the whole the whole story i better mm -hmm. pay attention to this and I think that's what yeah. Owlboy does as well. Like it's it's not very forgiving. It, it's it's not a hard game at all. But if you die, it's because it's because of you. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. Not cheap tricks. Exactly. Yeah, and that's that's what I really love. There, there's one scene in the entire game where I'm like, oh, okay, that was a little unfair because you you go down. It's kind of kind of like a Mega Man um, sort of thing. So you keep going down the screens and all that stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But when you fall down the screen, there's an enemy spawned right there. And I'm like, oh, I can't. Oh, no. I'm like, I can't avoid that. <laughs> but that's that's one enemy in the entire ten to twelve hour game. Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, you know, I'll, I'll take that because the rest of the game is just like just perfect in my opinion. Like it's so tight. And again, if you die, that's all on you. So uh, yeah, they really really respected the intelligence of their players, and they just said, cool. Here's our game. It's all good on our end, and if you can't make it, you suck. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Totally, totally agree with that. Yeah. All right. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there as well. Crack the hour mark. Sure. Um, again, if anyone wants to, I'm sure everyone who's listening has been blown away now. Um, so they're all eager to <laughs> rush off and find you on the internet. So whereabouts can they find you again? Uh, Twitch.tv forward slash Giraffe Raptor. Or yep. Draft Raptor over on Twitter. Cool. Um, um, the logo is a little scary because it was drawn by me and I am not an artist. It, so. it does look a little <laughs> bit like a swamp monster. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thanks, guys, for um, coming in front of the podcast. Again, if anyone else is listening, um, please give the podcast a rating if that's possible on the platform and charlie and harry's social links will be in the description or show notes um 
But yeah, guys, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. The hour flew by. It was insane. Yeah, man. Thank you for having us. No no worries. Worries, All right. Um, thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys for joining. I'll see you at the next podcast.